So in order to explain pacemaker codes and modes and where they came from, we need to take a little look at the history of pacemakers. In the early days, pacemakers really weren't all that complex. You would set the rate, implant the device, unable to change that rate. As pacemakers became more and more complex, capable of being reprogrammed, pacing and sensing in multiple chambers, a problem arose. Different companies and physicians were using different terms to explain how that pacemaker was programmed to function. In 1974, the Interest Society Commission for Heart Disease Resources recommended a three-letter code to help simplify and standardize terminology. In 1987, a committee from the North American Society for Pacing and Electrophysiology, NASPI, now known as Heart Rhythm Society, or HRS, and the British Pacing and Electrophysiology Group, BPEG, adopted a revision of the ICHD code. It became known as the NBG code, which stands for the NASPI BPEG generic code. Now that we have a little history, let's talk about the code. The code is made up of positions. There are five to be exact. Each position is assigned a letter, letting you know where and how the pacemaker is going to behave. The first position represents the chamber or chambers being paced. You can have A for atrium, V for ventricle, D for dual, meaning A and V, and you can have O for off. The second position represents the chamber or chambers that the pacemaker will sense in. Again, you have the letter A for atrium, V for ventricle, D for dual, A and V, and O for off. The third position represents how the pacemaker will respond to the sensing in position two. The options for position three are I for inhibit, meaning that the pacemaker will pace in the sign chamber unless it senses intrinsic activity, in which case it will inhibit or withhold pacing. T for trigger, this means that the pacemaker is capable of triggering an AV delay. D for dual, meaning inhibit and trigger. And you can have O for off. You should never actually see a device with T programmed in the third position. Pacemakers should only have a D, an I, or an O in the third position. We really only talk about the letter T to understand the concept of triggering an AV delay. The fourth position represents rate response or rate adaptive pacing. This position is represented by the letter R if rate response is on and is typically left blank if rate response is turned off. The fifth position represents multi-site pacing. The fifth position really isn't used, so we won't be discussing it any further in this presentation. To review, each of the positions of the MBG code is assigned a letter. It is a combination of those letters that describes how the pacemaker will function. Again, position one is chamber or chambers being paced. Position two, the chamber or chambers being sensed. Position three, the response to that sensing. Position four, rate response or rate adaptive pacing. From the different letter combinations, the pacemaker has several modes. It's easier if we break those modes up into single chamber modes and dual chamber modes. Let's talk about single chamber modes first. The single chamber modes are VOO, VVI, AOO, and AAI. Now let's look at each of those in more detail. First up is VOO. So if we go back to the code and break it down letter by letter, we have pacing in the ventricle, sensing is off, and a response to that sensing is off as well. Essentially what you end up with is a pacemaker that paces at the program rate regardless of the heart's intrinsic activity, also known as asynchronous pacing. In this example, the pacemaker is set to pace in VOO at 60 beats per minute, or if we convert that to milliseconds, every 1000 milliseconds. Here we see a pacing pulse that captures the heart, giving us this wide QRS morphology. Next, we see an intrinsic QRS. Since the pacemaker sensing is turned off, the pacemaker is unable to sense this intrinsic event, and therefore it paces again a thousand milliseconds after the first pacing pulse. And it'll continue to pace every 1000 milliseconds or 60 beats per minute with total disregard to what the heart's own intrinsic rate is. It just keeps pacing because of how it's programmed. That's all it knows how to do. On a side note, I wanted to point out this fusion beat. If you'll notice, this pace QRS is narrower than the rest. This is due to the combination of intrinsic conduction that is happening at the same time as the pace conduction resulting in a fusion of the two conductive wavefronts. 
and as a result, the Fusion Beat shows up as a narrower paced QRS. VVI pacing mode. We now have pacing in the ventricle, sensing in the ventricle, and our response to that sensing will be to pace or inhibit if we sense intrinsic activity. With the VVI in pacing mode, the pacemaker is capable of sensing the heart's intrinsic activity and inhibiting or withholding pacing when it's unnecessary. Let's look at VVI a little bit closer. In this example, the pacemaker is set to VVI with the lower rate of 60 beats per minute or every 1000 milliseconds. Here you can see the first beat is an intrinsic beat. The pacemaker appropriately sensed that beat in inhibited or withheld pacing. The way a pacemaker works is with every sensed or paced beat, the pacemaker starts a clock. In this example, that clock is a thousand milliseconds. And if at the end of that clock the pacemaker didn't see any intrinsic activity, it would have paced here. But because the pacemaker sensed this beat, it inhibited the pacing at the end of the clock. With the last sense beat, the clock is reset. This time the clock times out and the pacemaker doesn't sense any intrinsic activity and so it paces. Restarts its clock, doesn't see any activity, so again it paces here. Next we have a PVC. The pacemaker appropriately senses a PVC, restarts the clock, doesn't see any intrinsic activity before the clock times out and so it paces again here and again here. It's easy to see that the VVI mode is more capable than VOO. We are only pacing the heart when there is an absence of intrinsic activity. Pace when you need to, but not when you don't need to. AOO mode. We now have pacing in the atrium, sensing is turned off, and a response to that sensing is off as well. Once again, you end up with a pacemaker that paces at the programmed rate regardless of the heart's intrinsic activity. In this example, the pacemaker is set to a rate of 70 beats per minute. Here we see a paced atrial beat. And because our sensing is turned off, the pacemaker will continue to pace in the atrium at a rate of 70 beats per minute with total disregard to the heart's own intrinsic activity. If the atrial sensing was turned on, the pacemaker would have seen the atrial beats that are marked here by the green arrows. AAI we're now pacing in the atrium, sensing in the atrium, and a response to that sensing will be to pace or to inhibit if we sense intrinsic activity. Now the pacemaker should be able to adapt to what the intrinsic atrial rate is doing, pace when needed and inhibit when not needed. In this example, the pacemaker is set to a lower rate limit of 70 beats per minute. Here we have an intrinsic P wave followed by an intrinsic QRS. The pacemaker senses the P wave inhibits pacing, and then starts a clock. If you'll notice, the next P wave barely beats the clock, but it did so the pacemaker senses it and inhibits pacing. It then restarts the clock, and this time not sensing any intrinsic atrial activity before the clock runs out, it paces here. Restarts its clock, and paces again here, and here. With each paced or sensed beat, it restarts its clock, here we see a sensed P wave that came in before the clock timed out. The P wave was sensed and so pacing was inhibited. Here's another intrinsically inhibited beat and here's another paced beat. Dual chamber modes. The dual chamber modes are DDD, VDD, DDI, and DOO. It's easier if we break dual chamber modes up into two categories, tracking modes and non-tracking modes. The tracking modes are DDD and VDD, and the non-tracking modes are DDI and DOO. Now let's look at each mode a little bit closer. First up is DDD tracking mode. We are pacing in the atrium and the ventricle, we're sensing in the atrium and ventricle, and a response to that sensing will be to inhibit and or trigger an AV delay meaning that an intrinsic P wave and QRS can inhibit pacing in its respective chamber. The atrium will inhibit the atrium and the ventricle will inhibit the ventricle. But now, an intrinsic P wave or an atrial pace can also trigger an AV delay. In this mode, you end up with a pacemaker that can truly adapt to what the heart is doing. 
the pacemaker will mimic normal conduction as closely as possible. In this example, the pacemaker is set to a rate of 60 beats per minute with an AV delay of 200 milliseconds. Here we have an atrial sense. The pacemaker senses the beat and inhibits atrial pacing. After that atrial sense, the pacemaker starts an AV delay clock of 200 milliseconds. An intrinsic V-sense comes in before the AV delay timer times out and therefore inhibits ventricular pacing. Some pacemakers have atrial-based timing, while others have ventricular-based timing. For this example, we're going to assume that it's atrial-based timing. The pacemaker starts a clock with the atrial sense, looking for the next atrial sense. When the timer times out, it doesn't see any intrinsic atrial activity, and so it paces. It then starts an AV delay, but a ventricular sense comes in and inhibits pacing. Again, it starts a lower rate limit clock, doesn't sense any intrinsic atrial activity, and so it paces. Starts an AV delay, doesn't see a ventricular sense, and so it paces a ventricle here. Once again, starts its lower rate limit clock, doesn't see any atrial senses, so it paces the atrium here. Again, it starts the 200 millisecond AV delay, doesn't see any intrinsic ventricular activity, and so paces a ventricle here. Once again, the pacemaker starts its lower rate limit clock. This time, it's beat though by an atrial sense that comes in. The pacemaker starts an AV delay and paces in the ventricle. Next, we see an A sense followed by a V pace. And then another A sense followed by a V sense. In the DDD mode, the pacemaker will strive to maintain AV synchrony. Another thing to note is that with the DDD pacing mode, there are four distinct pacing patterns that you could potentially have at any time, depending on the patient's intrinsic conduction. These patterns are A sense V sense, A sense V pace, also known as P wave tracking, A pace V sense, and A pace V pace. Let's look at each of those in a little more detail. A sense V sense. If this pacing pattern is observed, it means that the patient has good sinus note function and good AV nodal function as well, resulting in complete inhibition of the pacemaker. The pacemaker really isn't doing a whole lot here other than sensing and watching and waiting for the patient's heart rate to slow down. A sense V pace. In this scenario, the patient has good sinus node function but poor AV nodal conduction. This is also known as P-wave tracking. The reason it is called P-wave tracking is because the pacemaker is tracking the patient's intrinsic atrial rate. If the patient's sinus rate increases, the pacemaker will see that increase and will appropriately pace the ventricle faster so as to maintain AV synchrony. If the atrial rate speeds up, the ventricle will follow or track right along with it. A-pace V-sense. In this scenario, the patient has poor sinus node function, but has intact AV nodal conduction. If you look at the rhythm strip, you see that we pace in the atrium, and that pacing pulse travels down through the heart's natural conduction pathways through the AV node and causes an intrinsic QRS. A pace, V pace. Here the patient has poor function in both the sinus node and the AV node, resulting in pacing in the atrium and ventricle. Those are the four possible pacing patterns of DDD pacing. Now let's move on to the second dual chamber tracking mode, VDD. With VDD, we are pacing in the ventricle, sensing in the atrium and the ventricle, and a response to that sensing will be to inhibit or trigger an AV delay meaning that an intrinsic QRS can inhibit ventricular pacing and an intrinsic P wave can trigger an AV delay. With this mode, there can be no pacing in the atrium, but an intrinsic P wave can trigger an AV delay, resulting in P wave tracking and possibly maintaining AV synchrony. In this example, we have a lower rate limit of 1000 milliseconds with an AV delay of 200 milliseconds. Here we see an atrial sense. Remember, the pacemaker is sensing in both the atrium and ventricle, and since it saw the atrial sense, and this is a tracking mode, the pacemaker is capable of triggering an AV delay. Next, we see a V sense that comes in before the AV delay times out, inhibiting ventricular pacing. 
Now since we are only able to pace in the ventricle, the pacemaker will start a clock with the last V sense or V pace. Notice that we pace the ventricle quite a bit before the 1000 millisecond lower rate limit timer timed out. That's because of an atrial sense that came in, which started an AV delay, resulting in a ventricular pace. Remember this A sense V pace pattern is called P wave tracking because we are tracking the sinus node function of the heart. If the atrial rate speeds up, the pace ventricular rate will follow. After the V pace, the pacemaker restarts its 1000 millisecond lower rate limit, but again, an A sense comes in, starts an AV delay, resulting in another ventricular pace. You can see this P wave tracking A sense V pace pattern continue on for the next three beats. After that, the patient has a PVC that comes in. The pacemaker senses the PVC and appropriately starts its 1000 millisecond lower rate limit clock which times out resulting in a V pace. You might notice there's something missing before the V pace. There's no atrial sense. This illustrates the major downfall of VDD programming. If at any point in time the sinus atrial rate drops below the pacemaker's program lower rate limit, it will result in a loss of AV synchrony since we are unable to pace in the atrium. Let's review VDD mode a little. We're able to pace or inhibit in the ventricle, sense in the atrium and ventricle, and an atrial sense will trigger an AV delay and help maintain AV synchrony. The VDD mode should only be used in patients with good sinus node function. This mode might be useful in a situation where a patient has a high pacing threshold in the atrium but intact sinus nodal function. This way we are able to sense in the atrium maintaining AV synchrony and not waste the battery life by pacing the high threshold atrium. The downfall of this mode, again, is if at any point in time the sinus atrial rate drops below the pacemaker's program lower rate limit, it will result in a loss of AV synchrony. Now let's move on to non-tracking modes. DDI non-tracking mode. We're going to pace in the atrium and ventricle, sense in the atrium and ventricle, and a response to that sensing will be to pace or inhibit. The DDI mode is a bit tricky to understand at first, but it really works as if we have an AAI and a VVI pacemaker operating together at the same time, but yet independent of each other. Okay, that last statement's a bit contradicting, so let me clarify a little. When in the DDI mode, the pacemaker is smart enough to know that when it's pacing at the lower rate limit in the atrium, it will pace in the atrium, start an AV delay, and then pace in the ventricle. Sounds a lot like DDD, right? Well, here's where it's different. In the DDI mode, the pacemaker can only start an AV delay when it's pacing at the lower rate limit in the atrium. If at any point in time the sinus atrial rate exceeds the program lower rate limit, the pacemaker will sense in the atrium at whatever the sinus rate is. It will not trigger an AV delay, therefore disassociating the atrium from the ventricles. Then it will pace in the ventricle at the lower rate limit unless inhibited by a ventricular sensed event. This can play out one of two ways. The first way is if the patient has poor AV node function. This can result in the patient having a sensed atrial rate of 90 beats per minute and a paced ventricular rate of 60 beats per minute. Communication between the atrium and ventricles only happens at the lower rate limit. Once the atrium starts sensing, the connection between the A and the V is terminated. Since there is no more communication, the pacemaker can't trigger an AV delay and can't P wave track. As the intrinsic sinus rate increases, the paced ventricular rate will remain at the lower rate limit, resulting in a loss of AV synchrony. The second way it plays out is if the patient has intact AV node function, they can conduct down to the ventricle intrinsically on their own, inhibiting V pacing and maintaining AV synchrony. This would appear as A sense V sense, or in other words, normal conduction. Okay, now back to the DDI example. Here we see an atrial pace. Since we pace in the atrium, the pacemaker starts an AV delay, which times out and then we pace in the ventricle. Next, we see an A to A clock start, telling us when the next atrial pace is going to occur. It's roughly 70 beats per minute in this example. Because we paced in the atrium, we can start another AV delay. 
Now because this is DDI mode, the pacemaker is running a separate clock for the ventricle as well. Here we see the V to V timer running, after which we V pace. Next we start our A to A timer again. This time we have an atrial sense beat that comes in just before we would have paced. Since we didn't pace in the atrium, there is no more communication between the A and the V. No AV delay can be started. No worries though, we still have our V to V timer that starts, resulting in a ventricular pace. Once again, our A to A timer starts, and pacing is inhibited by another atrial sense. Next, our V to V timer starts again, resulting in another ventricular pace. Next, we have an atrial sense, followed by a V pace, and another atrial sense, followed by another V pace. If you look back at the last four beats, it resembles P wave tracking, but it's not. The sinus atrial rate just happens to be going slightly faster than the paced ventricular rate. The sinus atrial rate is slowly increasing until it is fast enough that the patient is able to intrinsically conduct down the AV node as seen in the next beat. We have an atrial sense here. Next we see our V to V timer, but pacing was inhibited by a ventricular sense that came in. The DDI mode is primarily used in patients with atrial tachyarrhythmias and in mode switch algorithms, which hopefully we'll go over in more detail in another video. P-wave tracking is great for AV synchrony, but if the patient goes into AFib, we don't want to track their atrium and pace the ventricle at 300 beats per minute. The DDI non-tracking mode is useful in this situation because it disassociates or decouples the atrium from the ventricle and therefore won't track fast rates such as atrial fibrillation. DOO non-tracking mode, where pacing in the atrium and ventricle, sensing is off, and a response to that sensing is off. This mode results in AV sequential pacing at the lower rate limit regardless of the heart's own intrinsic activity. Essentially, we're asynchronously pacing. In this example, the pacemaker is set to a rate of 60 beats per minute with an AV delay of 200 milliseconds. First, we see an atrial pace. The DDO mode is AV sequential pacing, so the pacemaker starts an AV delay of 200 milliseconds, after which we V pace. Let's assume that this pacemaker has ventricular based timing. Now remember that a rate of 60 beats per minute is 1000 milliseconds. So if we subtract our 200 millisecond AV delay, that means we have 800 milliseconds from our last V pace until our next A pace. This is known as a VA timer. Now don't get too hung up on the names of the timers right now. We'll be learning more about timing cycles in the next video. After our A pace, we start another 200 millisecond AV delay, and then V pace. We then start our VA timer of 800 milliseconds and pace in the atrium. Then we start our AV delay again and pace in the ventricle. This pacing pattern will go on and on and on until the mode is changed. Now we don't know why this patient has been set to DOO mode, but ideally we would like to have sensed several intrinsic beats circled here in green and then inhibited pacing when it wasn't necessary. The DOO mode is useful only in certain situations. In magnet mode, when a magnet is placed over the pacemaker, when troubleshooting, and sometimes when a patient is having surgery, they may need to be programmed to DOO so that surgical equipment doesn't interact with the pacemaker. Rate response. Rate response or rate adaptive pacing is used in patients with chronotropic incompetence. Chronotropic incompetence is defined as the inability of the heart to appropriately increase its rate with increased activity or metabolic demand and produces exercise intolerance which may impair quality of life. For example, during exercise, walking down a hallway or climbing several flights of stairs. Chronotropic incompetence is often used in the pacing world to describe sinus node dysfunction where the patient is unable to increase their heart rate appropriately with activity. The pacemaker uses sensors to detect activity and then pace the heart at an increased rate. There are typically two different sensors in the world of pacing. The accelerometer, which detects motion, and minute ventilation, which detects changes in the patient's breathing. The pacemaker takes the information it gets from the sensors, plugs it into an algorithm to determine how much of a heart rate increase the patient should get based off of what the sensor is saying. 
It's important to know there are a lot of changes that can be made to the rate response programming. Oftentimes, patients will need to have changes made in order to optimize how well that sensor is working for that particular patient. Everyone is different. Settings that work well for one patient may not work for another. Here is an example of sensor rate pacing. Notice at the beginning of the rhythm strip, the pacemaker is pacing at a rate of 75 beats per minute. As we move along the rhythm strip, the heart rate is slowly increasing according to the pacemaker sensors. Now notice at the end of the rhythm strip, the pacemaker is pacing at about a rate of 100 beats per minute. If we slide the 75 beat per minute measurement over to the 100 beat per minute measurement, it becomes more noticeable. The sensor is detecting the patient's activity and telling the pacemaker to slowly increase the rate to meet the patient's needs. Now that we've covered rate response and the different pacemaker modes, you might be asking yourself, how do we choose the best mode for the patient? In order to choose the best mode, we need to take into consideration a few things first. Cardiac output and AV synchrony. Cardiac output is defined as stroke volume times heart rate. AV synchrony is the timing between the atrium and the ventricles. There should always be an atrial contraction followed by a ventricular contraction. AV synchrony helps maintain the proper opening and closing of the AV valves, the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve, otherwise known as the mitral valve. Most of the blood that fills the ventricle is passive, meaning it just kind of flows or falls into the ventricle. At the end of passive filling, the atrium contracts, injecting out roughly the last 20% of the blood from the atrium into the ventricle. This is also known as atrial kick. After the atrial kick, the pressure in the ventricles becomes greater than the pressure in the atrium, causing the AV valves to close and preventing blood from flowing back into the atrium. When someone is in atrial fibrillation, or they don't have proper AV synchrony, it results in a loss of volume in the ventricles, decreasing the stroke volume, and ultimately decreasing the patient's cardiac output. It's believed that the atrial contribution to the cardiac output can be as much as 10 to 30 percent. Therefore, choosing the correct pacing mode that maintains good AV synchrony for the patient can be very important. If proper AV synchrony isn't maintained, some complications can occur. The most common is pacemaker syndrome. Pacemaker syndrome is a disease that represents the clinical consequence of suboptimal atrial ventricular synchrony or AV dyssynchrony, regardless of the pacing mode after pacemaker implantation. Symptoms of pacemaker syndrome are cannon A waves, chest pain, congestive heart failure, confusion, dizziness, fatigue, near syncope, palpitations, pulmonary edema, pulsations in the neck, shortness of breath, and syncope. So the big question is, do we want to maintain AV synchrony? And the answer is almost always yes. In order to maintain AV synchrony, the patient must have a viable atrium, meaning the heart must be capable of generating a signal strong enough to be sensed by the pacemaker, capable of being captured electrically and mechanically from the pacing pulse, and the patient must not be chronically in an atrial arrhythmia such as atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. If the patient has a healthy enough atrium, we will always want to maintain AV synchrony if possible. Next, we're going to break down which mode should be chosen for a patient that is indicated for a pacemaker. The first question we need to ask is, is the patient in an atrial arrhythmia or are they normal sinus brady? This will help us determine the sinus node function and help us decide which mode the patient should be in. Let's look at atrial arrhythmias first. The next question we need to ask is, is the patient in a chronic atrial arrhythmia or is it paroxysmal in nature? If the patient's in a chronic atrial arrhythmia, the next question we have is, is the patient chronotropically incompetent? If the answer is yes, our pacing mode should be VVIR. If the answer is no, a good mode to choose is VVI, but VVIR can be chosen as well. If the patient has paroxysmal atrial arrhythmias, meaning that they are in and out of atrial arrhythmias, the next question we need to ask again is, is the patient chronotropically incompetent? If the answer is yes again, the best pacing mode is DDDR. If the answer is no, the best mode to choose is DDD. Now let's look at patients with normal or sinus brady conduction. The first question we need to ask is, is the AV node conduction intact? 
If the answer is yes, the next question we want to ask is, is the patient chronotropically incompetent? If that answer is yes, the best mode would be AAIR. If the answer is no, we can choose AAI. I would like to say, typically in the US, we will rarely, if ever, see anybody programmed to AAI or AAIR. There's just too many legalities of it. Most of these patients will probably be programmed DDD or DDDR, just so that we know we have backup pacing in the ventricle if the patient should ever need it. Back up to the AV node conduction question. If the answer is no, the next question is again, is the patient chronotropically incompetent? If that answer is yes, the best pacing mode is DDDR. If the answer is no, the best pacing mode is DDD.